Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our longtime listeners are no stranger to our guest today, composer, educator, and music historian Dr. Robert Greenberg. He's been on the show many times, and we refer to him often when he's not. Pete discovered Dr. Bob's lessons on literate music when he was in Afghanistan. He would use his downtime to study up on the great composers and their work, and the most comprehensive place to get that education, bar none, is in Dr. Bob's curriculum on the great courses, which you can get at robertgreenbergmusic.com. In this episode, Pete brings up the great classical melodies that have infiltrated our lives and pop culture, and Dr. Bob discusses their origins. He also plies us with martinis and artisan cheeses and charcuterie, as he often does. This is the last episode Nico recorded with us before moving to Maui to become a vegan chef and otherwise never have a shirt on. And the last episode we recorded in Dr. Bob's Kitchen, which my company shortly thereafter completely demolished to remodel the entire main floor of his house. Shout out to DRB Homes and Design, where I worked during the day, and to Drew and Carlton, who swung the hammers to take the place apart. In fact, the kitchen in which we recorded this episode was down to the studs this week, so you'll be hearing a bit of history. We'll recap it on the construction podcast, Breaking Ground. We'll be finished with the project soon, and it'll be glorious, and we'll continue our education in a new kitchen with our very, very dear friend. We love him, and you will love him, too. He is Dr. Bob Greenberg. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg, and welcome back to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Welcome back. Indeed, we are at Casa Greenberg, which you listeners know what that means. We're halfway in the tank. Uh, We are drinking delicious martinis that Dr. Bob has prepared for us, as he often has. Uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Pete. What's that? I'm by my co-host, Nico. That is me. And here in Casa Greenberg, there are a couple things that happen typically, but tonight is special because it's bachelor night. Bachelor night. It's just the four of us. We got Dan in the room also. We're eating mac and cheese. That was Dan's. The rest of us are eating charcuterie and chicken wings. A good combination. Lots of cheeses. Dr. Bob emptied the refrigerator on us. And, uh, of course, crackers because we need carbs. Now, we came here tonight with a particular mission. What is that mission, Pete? Well, I thought we might take a look at, since Dr. Bob is the literate music expert, take a look at music that we would instantly recognize that's super hooky. Like what are the greatest hooks from the, the literate music world? Things that just are so sticky that you don't have to even, the moment you hear that music, if you were to play it over and over again, you could make a modern song out of it in an instant. That's sort of the thought process. Okay. And just to get a few things out of the way, if you're not already familiar with Dr. Bob Greenberg and his work, you should go to robertgreenbergmusic.com. And you should sign up for every fucking thing, I swear. Yeah. Sign up for Music History Monday, where this week you will have learned that George Gershwin uh, died at the ripe old age of 38. 38. Yeah. <clears throat> what a travesty. What a tragedy. And, yeah. 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 And, and plenty of other things, because there are plenty of composers who died young. Mozart and... Schubert. You list, you list Chopin. several. Chopin. Yeah. Chopin, Schubert. But Music History Monday will give you a look into the the world of literate music. We don't call it classical music around here. We call it literate music. A look into the world of literate music that will give you a vocabulary that will broaden the way that you understand the music that you regularly listen to, if that's not what you're already regularly listening to. And a lot of our listeners are listening to a lot of contemporary music. So I will challenge you guys to subscribe to everything. I will also tell you, go back, and you'll find this on the robertgreenbergmusic.com, and take the course that was one of the great courses, which is how to listen to and understand great music. Because it puts a lot of things into perspective, and there are plenty of notes in your life that you don't recognize that will make you go, oh, no shit. 
that's where I got that, or that's where I heard those things, or that's how I put that together. And you'll realize that literate music has influenced your life a whole lot more than you thought it did. So, with that in mind, Pete, your challenge to Dr. Bob yes. was to put together, what did you, how was your challenge? I just said, you know, let's get a couple of hooks that we could talk about and base a conversation on. And I said, you know, a six, eight, something like that. And then I also said, inevitably, we'll go directly off course and talk about, you know, Miley Cyrus again or something. But uh, that was it. Like, just just get a couple of things. And I, I, I kind of. Has anyone talked about Miley Cyrus since she lost her virginity? I mean, didn't that uh, she just like became a no interest, right? Yeah, well, her house was threatened, if not burned down, in the Malibu fire. That's so right. that made her relevant. Okay. But, I mean, that's a significant thing. Re-relevance. So, yeah, right? yeah, re-relevance. Re-relevance. Yes. But, yeah, so, we, so I wet the whistle by a little bit by talking about some Bach and, like, Beethoven's Fifth, you know. And, and that's been used in, in modern times with Hooked on Classics. Beethoven's you know? Fifth? Oh, my yeah. God, what's been done to Beethoven's Fifth. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's disco strings. Fifth. Disco Fifth. How did you react to the Disco Fifth when it was new? I laughed my butt off. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> disco by its nature. Mm-hmm. It's very funny music. Yeah. And I played in the disco band, and at some point, you'd like me to go downstairs and bring up pictures of us in our matching leisure suits. Yes. Understand that with I, our white I belts. absolutely want yeah, that yeah. to happen. That, and then, yes. Yeah, we got yeah. confirmed triple Cleveland, white belt, white shoes, You know, it was, it was, you know, Philadelphia Freedom, and... That was... But disco was funny. Yeah. Yeah. The outfits were funny. The look was funny. The music was funny. So a fifth of Beethoven, and I'll remember the guy, Murphy, something something Murphy. I'll remember his name in a moment. You know, it was on the soundtrack of, yeah. uh, of Saturday, uh, Saturday Night, Night Fever, Fever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's what made it. But poor Beethoven's fifth has been exposed to more, more murderous ugliness than any other piece of music in history. It was used for, do you remember a, a pain medication called Vanquish? Sure. It was, uh, you know, uh, the Excedrin of the 1970s. Yeah. Well, because it started with a V, they used Beethoven's fifth. pa 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 pum because Morse code for V is pa 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 pum da 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 dash <laughs> Really? Yeah, da 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 dash And, you know, during the Second World War, Churchill was famous for his V for victory sign yeah, with right. his hands. And so, so V for victory, vanquish, vanquish will be victor over your pain. Mm-hmm. Morse code, Beethoven's fifth. Right. So it's it's hard to know where the indignities stop. and the Roman five being the V. That right there you go. So yeah, yeah, yeah. another one. Good for you, Jim. So that's the obvious one. Yeah, and that's kind of what you were after, right? What is the hooky poppy uh, equivalent? And this whole thing was born from from uh, we went to go see some fine arts. I like to do that. You know, I've been taught well by Doctor Bob and my dad. And we heard Bolero, and for the next several days. Neither of us could stop going, and like I might just lightly say, like do the snare line, and you're off. Jump, you, check it to jump. Yeah, check it to jump. Exactly, and you're just barely hitting that drum, but it doesn't matter. That is, it's absolute bonding power in your head, and you can't get it out. So that's what I wanted to explore. And the way I took the challenge was how much of this, and I love the way you put this, John. Thank you. you called it literate music. What that means is that it exists wholly in notation, Mm. as opposed to jazz, as opposed to rock and roll, as opposed to hip hop, as opposed to rap, which are improvised musics as much as they are notated musics. You don't need to write this stuff down. It's an oral language. But notated music or so-called classical music is not an oral language. I mean, you know, it's informed by oral tradition, but you got it's all written down. So concert music is another way of of, of identifying it. And my challenge as I took it was to come up with pieces of concert music, notated music, literate music, mm-hmm. that the general public, whether it realizes it or not, because of media, because of Looney Tunes cartoons, because we're surrounded by so much stuff, folks know this music, whether they realize it or not. They yeah, just absolutely. don't know that it was written by Beethoven yeah. in 1808. For Let example. me ask you a question about the literacy of music, though, because nowadays we have Jay-Z, and he is, uh, you know, absolutely one of my favorites. But he, he also famously does not write things down. And it's because he spent his time learning a verse and then another verse. Actually, a word and then two words. And just expanding his rap vocabulary to the point where he was able to walk into the studio with the preparation already done. Now, do you think that in a day and age where... 
you simply had to capture your musical ideas by putting pen to paper. Because that's the difference, is that now we have the means to put a microphone in front of a guy and go, here, go nuts, man, and allow him to make music and capture it. But back then, the way to capture a musical notion was to grab a pen and put it down on paper. I would make a distinction, because good memory has always existed. And frankly, writing, <clears throat> one could argue, and it has been argued lots of times, that when we started writing things down roughly 5,000 years ago, we stopped using our memories. We stopped telling these long epic stories that were remembered by generation after generation Past after generation. Mm -hmm. we, we forgot how to remember. And I'd say that that's absolutely true. You know, notation of anything is a device that aids memory, a mnemonic device. And we become more dependent on the written word and less dependent on our memories. So I would say, generally speaking, Writing changed everything, and music notation changed music forever, but not in the way you're talking about. I, I would make a distinction, and again, I'm going to sound really snotty, snobby, sorry, apologize. But there is a basic difference between music in the oral tradition and music in the notational tradition, and that difference is... Repetition. Versus development. Mm -hmm. Exactly, versus development. Popular music... Oral tradition music is what we call generally expository music. Hmm. It consists of its basic theme or a couple of thematic ideas, which run their course, and then a typically three to five minute piece comes to its conclusion, mm -hmm. the course being run. Yeah. But notated music implies that something's been written down, reconsidered, rewritten, mm -hmm. reconsidered, and extended. It's the difference between storytelling and writing a novel. Right. No one can recite a novel off the top of her head. It's the difference between conversation and the Gettysburg Address. Thank you. When we write things down, the implication is that we are critically addressing what we wrote down in such a way that we can rewrite it, reconsider it, reconstrue, build something, and then review and end what we said. So it's an entirely different creative process and it's one that coexists perfectly well with oral tradition music but it's just different and I, I, this is something that fascinates me and I'm sure it does not fascinate your listeners so we won't get into it at length but you know when music notation was invented in the 800s it was purely in a the 800s. yeah yeah <laughs> well it was it was a political act it was a it was a power move by the Roman church all of these various churches all over Europe were going their own direction. They were creating their own liturgy, meaning their own music, their own prayers, their own this, their own that. Well, the Pope or the Bishop of Rome is saying, hey, whoa, dudes, what are we, chopped liver? We're, we're the Roman freaking church. We're the church yeah, we're the of bosses Peter. around here. Yeah. We're supposed to be telling you what to do. Uh -huh. How did the Roman church reassert its power? It Recorded. hired people that mm -hmm. could figure out how to create basic notation they could notate the Roman chants, and then these people went to the different cities, taught the notation, and taught how to do it properly. No kidding. And so originally it was a mnemonic device, a way of how to remember the Roman style of singing. And yeah. it, was, it was an assertion of the power of the Roman church. But soon enough, you needed to get more sophisticated with the notation. You yeah. needed to be able to indicate pitches more clearly, rhythms more clearly. And before you know it, you need an expert to write these things down. This is the creation of the composer. You need an expert to be able to read it. This is the evolution of the performer as we understand him and her. Someone who could look at a page and without ever having heard it, Perform reproduce it. the music. It's mm -hmm. no longer a mnemonic device. Right. It's no longer helping me to remember. It's creating memory. And before you know it, the music exists on paper, and paper becomes the canon. It's no longer in the memory. It's no longer in the ear. It's the creation of a canon, meaning a, and so that's a repertoire. When, when you have written instruction, adagio, or whatever it's going to be, it's all in Italian because that's, that's the language of this music. The, lang the, the notational language of those words evolved in the 15 and 1600s when Italian music masters okay. were predominant across Europe in every location. Mm. But a lot, of, um, a lot of composers have rebelled against that. For a while, Beethoven insisted on writing all his instructions in German. Wow. 
But no one understood him outside of Germany. So, I mean, you're, you're like hurting yourself now, dude. Did Whereas, he shake his fist and yell, Auf Deutsch, Auf Deutsch, Auf prob- Deutsch? Yeah, yeah, that was probably the nicest thing he yelled. <laughs> I don't yeah. imagine yeah. a cellist <laughs> leaning over to his buddy and going, what the hell is this? Yeah. That's German for mezzo piano. <laughs> so one of the things that I learned from Dr. Bob is that the Romans in particular had a special reverence for the power of music, that their... Reverence for the power of music had to do with the fact that it was a spiritual. The Greeks. Uh, uh, the oh, it was the Greeks. the Greeks. See, this is how I fuck things up, Pete. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, but Nobody you're never, knows but better you than Pete the how term, I fuck dude. things up. You okay. know, you skip, you skip the, the midterm, man. <laughs> that's the story of my education. <laughs> 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 I skipped the midterm. The only thing that I, yeah, the only difference is when I skipped the midterm, I was high. Anyway. <laughs> well. Um, so, with the Roman ability to capture music being used as a tool to further their dominance as 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 an organization the roman church the roman church right they were really able to i mean this is no different than the vehicle for furthering really any movement on a grand scale corner you corner the market on in this case a media mm-hmm. an entire media a written media and an oral media meaning a sound media Exactly. You know, I, I, I'm always fascinated. So many things that are positive are done for reasons that are questionable. Yeah, and, uh, and, and here's a case <laughs> where, where, where a, power, a power move, yeah. you know, supposedly this whole lie was told about how this wonderful Pope, Pope Gregory I, who ruled, I don't know, about from 606 to about 620, because this was, this was, you know, 150 years later, they made up this story that the dove of God oh. perched on Pope Gregory's shoulder and whispered all of these plain chants, these prayers to him, and he wrote them down. Because this was the lie they were telling. This was to validate right. these notations that were created in the 800s. That is a wonderfully nice piece of horse shit. You know, I mean, create your own <laughs> myths. And these, these wonderful pieces of illuminated uh, illustration from the time of showing God's dove on Gregory's ear whispering into his ear while a scribe sits outside trying to write everything down. And uh, so with politics, you know, politics. But, but here's where politics did us all a favor. And this is where Western music converged with all the other world musics because Western music became, in this way, the first notated tradition. Not to say there still wasn't an oral tradition. There is. But this notated tradition created the composer. And you know what? As soon as you start writing things down that come from your own heart there's the temptation to do the thing mm. sign your name on it yeah right now this is my ego well because you got to get some booty from that you're well like, even if you're supposedly for you. writing for god exactly yeah. oh this is for god yeah but yeah. i wrote it yeah right and, right. and the, look this is so much better than the crap that, that bill wrote over there yeah. you know and, and nco i'm sorry <laughs> for sure I'm, I'm the dude right yeah. god loves me best yeah and these signatures started becoming regular in the 1300s and the 14th century and as soon as ego gets involved, the music's all about me. It's about my world. It's about my girlfriends. It's about my boyfriends. It's about my experience. It's about my good taste. Mm-hmm. And I want you to honor me. And that's where Western music diverged. It no longer became a ritual, ceremonial bulwark against change mm. in its world. It became something that changed instantly. Because mm. as the world changed, so did the way composers expressed those changes in their own music. If you are a musician and you read music from the 800s when they first started, you know, writing full notes and quarter notes and everything, is it like reading old, like high German where you're like, ah, you know, this is, I can see the roots or, or it has the language stayed sort of pure where you can actually no, use No, you can't stuff. read it at all and they're not even writing quarter notes and eighth notes. Quarter notes and eighth notes d- didn't start being used regularly until the 1600s. So they no. were just really, it was some elementary form of what we know it to be it's now. It's called pneumatic notation. Mm-hmm. And this is where clusters of notes were indicated with various squiggles and squirms. And there's equivalent in, uh, in, in Jewish psalmody and Jewish notation, old mm-hmm. biblical notation, in uh, Arabic notation. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't really until the 1400s and 1500s that individual pitches were given individual notes. Wow. Mm. And the rhythms as we understand them today and the Mm -hmm. codification of the system, that's from the 1600s. It's fairly recent. 
uh, what we think of as major There were hundreds location. of years of captured music before they decided to assign rhythms. Individual, They're, correct. Wow. But the mnemonic notation of the 10th and 11th and 12th and 13th centuries got more sophisticated as it went. But it wasn't until a guy named Guido of Arezzo, a, 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 I him. a Benedictine, uh, figured that maybe we should be doing this one symbol per pitch. Okay. And it evolved slowly over time. And notation continues to evolve, to tell you the truth. So who knows what's going to be done in five or 600 years. Well, let me ask you this, because we can put it in the context of technology, which we see accelerating, moving faster and faster. Does the evolution of notation of music move with that kind of speed? No. Is it right now moving faster or slower than it has been in centuries past? I think we've reached a really good settled place where settled place all have agreed on certain things because close to a plateau yeah. right well a plateau kind too. of a plateau I mean, close. Right. but the thing is we're using a tune we've been using the same tuning system consistently now okay for at least 300 years all right well tempered tuning uh, or equal tempered tuning rather since the 1860s but let's just say dividing the octave into 12 equal segments or almost equal segments. Yeah. This has been standard now since the late 1500s. So the notation system now is perfectly suited for that division of the octave. Right. Now every now and then you get some crazy, some nut who wants to experiment with other stuff. There was a guy named Harry Parch, a fascinating American weirdo, who created a music based on dividing the octave into 43 Oh, jeez. Separate semitones or microtones. I, I thought maybe you were going to say that the guy was Indian. No, no, Parch, actually, Parch was born here in Oakland, California. Okay. And, uh, and he, was just, he was just one of these American iconoclasts. Wow. And he grew up during the Depression. And well, actually, that's not true. He was a hobo during the Depression. He grew up in the. In so the, far, he grew he's up pretty in the damn cool. 20s. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, no. I know, he, my kind of he guy. Taught, right taught at Mills College for a oh, while. Okay. But he fancied Did he, he know why he taught it? You know why he taught it at Mills no, 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 College? Because that's, years. Wrong, wrong, that's where the chicks later. were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 100 years later. But yeah. he believed that the whole Western canon of music was, was based on a, a limited pitch system that in no way could possibly feed his imagination. Now, obviously, there's no instruments out there that can play a 43 pitch octave. So he built them. Wow. He built a whole series of these percussion instruments and such that allowed him to play all this stuff. No, it all sounds like an out of tune honky tonk yeah. piano. I have to tell you, in all honesty, was that se um, separation into twelve parts? Was that an accidental discovery? No. Like, oh, okay, so it was purposeful. Quite purposeful, and we can talk about that if you really want to bore the crap out of your mm. listeners. But, but back to Harry, he had to create a whole new notational system. I right? have a friend because the, otherwise there was no way to notate those those pitches. But yeah. as long as we're still generally using a twelve pitch octave, the current notation system will work okay. I, work I have okay. a question. So when you have all these annotations, and and some of it looks quite complex, but how do you know as a pipe organ guy with I don't know one hundred and fifty individual options that can be billions of options how do you know which flipper to flip and which knob to pull and which button to push with your foot it sounds like a sex ed conversation i know yeah <laughs> right um hey pete push well, the buttons well listen you're, you're the you're the organist you yeah. know isn't this something that all organists have to do by their own personal taste ultimately? it's not because he can play the organ he I was know he gained the nickname organist when he was in the army because <laughs> it was lonely out there anyway <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. This sounds like a conversation about something it's not about. Yeah. But so so it's, it's preference. When it comes to what stops you pull out mm -hmm. on an organ, for, yeah. for your listeners, you know, these big old pipe organs and even electric organs today, they consist, they're basically an orchestra for fingers. That was the concept of the pipe organ. And you have these different ranks of pipes. So you might have one set of pipes that spans the most of the organ keyboard that's meant to sound like flutes. Then you'll have another set or rank of pipes that are meant to sound like trumpets. Yeah. You'll have another set of pipes that are meant to sound like basses, contrabasses, string basses. And so a big organ might have 40 ranks of pipes. That is 40 different sets of pipes, each one tuned and built to sound like another instrument. So it's a one-person orchestra. Right. And the way you activate these different ranks of pipes is in a in an old-style pipe organ, you have to pull out a rod. And by pulling that rod out, it's got a little knob on it, you pull out that rod, and that allows air now to go into that next rank of pipes. 
And these rods are called stops. Mm -hmm. And so the phrase pulling out all the stops means you're blowing air through every rank of pipe. That's as loud as an organ can be. And boy, whoever's operating the bellows, if they're not electric, is working really hard at that yeah. moment because a lot of air is getting sucked up. And so the pulling out all the stops means literally blowing through all the pipes at the same time. But deciding what stops to use right. as an organist mm -hmm. is a very personal choice. Because on, on a pipe organ, you might have at least two, but if not five ranks of keys. And on, on, in front of each key, you have buttons. Down by your feet, you have something to toggle with. Not just the pedals, but like right. selections. Right, right. You, you might have five manuals, five keyboards, right. plus all of the stops. Yes. And it is it's a, basically you're orchestrating as you go, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Basically, you're orchestrating as you go, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. So, but that's... Now, the degree that, that you pull the stop out, though, is, is graduated. It's not like there's a surprise in there halfway where you're, you know, you're going from the, the rank that simulates the flutes to the rank that simulates the trumpets to the rank that simulates the trombones. I think it's the, either on or off. Yeah, they're okay. binary. It, you're, either, sure. you're either in or out. Hmm. So either, either you're going through that... Because you can't have a partial, because if there was a partial airflow, you would, it wouldn't make any sound. Hmm. You know, if you look at the pipe organ, it's, it's like a flute or a, like a, a whistle. Yeah. You, you need to have a certain amount of air going through there just to make a sound. It's like 400 whistles. Yeah, yeah. or, or in, these, so, in these big organs, it's like 4,000 whistles. When you launch into the next rank, you're in. Right. Okay. So, but my point on that was that the ranks are graduated from the soprano instruments to the bass instruments. Correct. Is that true? Um, okay. I, I, you know what? This is something I can't address because my guess is, depending on the organ, is depending on where those particular knobs are. I would think if I was designing an organ, I'd want to put the bass ranks down near the bass notes yeah. in, in the manual. Sure. So if I'm down there, I'm already in that lower You're in area. That register, yeah. But I've seen organs where... The, the ranks of uh, stops are on like panels to yeah. the right and left of the It's keyboard. like a cockpit. Yeah. It's crazy. That's exactly, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a great comparison. But I want to say this, Pete. Mm. The only thing that makes me happier than drunken consumption of charcuterie uh -huh. is conversation with Dr. Bob with a historical context around big pipes. Mm-hmm. Large organs, which yeah. is what we've always heard about Dr. Bob right. in the first place. Stroking the horn. Yeah. Right. All and from a historical standpoint, though. While eating salami. Yeah. Organs aside, which is, the, na which is the name of my, ma my next musical. Organ. <laughs> Organs right. aside. Organs right. aside. You know, as we're progressing, because we were talking about musical notation as a device for uh, mnemonic. Well, originally mnemonic to, to help. To help remember. But, but we have to be careful. Mnemonic memory, pneumatic notation. Right. Two different words. So mnemonic memory, pneumatic notation, and we want to move into where the bridge is for the gap between the literate music of centuries past and this list. Because I want our listeners to know that you challenged Dr. Bob to come up with a couple of yeah. tunes that we would be familiar with that would be the, and this is an oversimplification of your challenge, but would be the, you know, the pop tune, the thing that rings in your head, the yeah. thing that's sticky. And we walked into uh, a kitchen full of martinis, mm -hmm. but we also walked into a stapled document. This is a document that required a staple. Yeah. So let's talk about these tunes and what and made them And my attitude sticky. was, I want to come up with stuff that you would know at, at the most, at maximum, like six to eight yeah. notes. Yeah, right. You know, what... Between one and eight notes, are we going to instantly recognize a piece of music? Is its hook right at the top? Right. And in this case, the hooks are right at the top. And the very heard... first one. There you go. That sounds like a hip-hop song. 
It just <laughs> does. You know? Do, 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 do. You can just do that over and over again. But yeah. the test is, Nico, do you know that melody? No. See, we should, we should, we, you're going to need to play the recordings. I can do that. <clears throat> yeah, you you'll drop that these, in there. You're going to need to drop these puppies in there. But right the now. other thing is, on a generational measure. Nico didn't grow up with Donkey Kong like you and I did. Right. Or, or the same kind right. of Saturday morning cartoons. Right. Because like you said, Bugs Bunny and all those guys. Yeah, a lot the of Looney Tunes was, was yeah. just, just endless font of... Is that because the stuff, they could get that stuff for free? No, I think, I think it was because when these cartoons came out in the 40s and 50s, and 60s originally, I think you had a much more sophisticated... We've got to remember, they played these cartoons in movie theaters yeah. before feature films. That's true. So these were adults listening to this stuff, adults who, who laughed their butts off when they did Wagner opera you know, and making fun of it and recognized all this stuff. So I think it also had to do with the original audience that was watching these things. We think of these as kids' cartoons, but they were originally not for kids. They were, they were for adult movie audiences. But the guy who was the John Williams of the time... Mm-hmm. His name was Carl Stalling. Carl Stalling? I don't know. You're on your own here. <laughs> yeah. He composed all of the Looney Tunes mm-hmm. stuff and the and I think his was he Mel Blanc's cousin or his something? His desire he was the Mel Blanc of composition sure. for cartoons. His desire was to challenge the audience. And I think the more obscure references he could pull and make familiar the more the more he felt good about it and that's me making it up in my head but there is a recording out there that was released and i think it's called like the hits of carl stalling <laughs> and you put it on and it's a cd that's got like 152 tracks and some of them are a, a minute long and some of them are 5 seconds long and it's hilarious you don't even need whatever the cartoon was because you can tell you can tell that that was Bugs Bunny cross dressing and kissing somebody on the forehead. You know, welcome to my life. Or you can, <laughs> or you can tell that it was the Road Runner and mm-hmm. he and he took off running, and Wiley e. Coyote was lighting the you yeah. know the Acme jet powered roller skates beneath him. You could hear all of these things and all the mental references for anybody who's familiar with any of those cartoons come alive instantly, and I think that. You know, if if I can make some predictions about him, he was challenging his audience all the time. So here's the big question then, because we have the perfect test case right here. Mm. We've got Nico. Right. We got we got X generation. Is that right? I keep I, I keep I, I can't. We're keep generation to... X. <clears throat> I'm a centennial. Worthless. Correct. Same you thing. know, that's that's so harsh. <laughs> and I'm I'm a pure boomer. <laughs> and I'm booming all the time now. But anyway, Especially after I've eaten meat. Right, yeah. Okay. I mean, for example, I mean, I take for granted that everyone has seen the movie Platoon. Mm-hmm. And we've heard that Adagio for Strings by, by Barber so many times. Right. We only have to hear the beginning. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the movie Platoon? You know, unfortunately, my uh, movie repertoire is not very large. So I, no. I, I try, man. I believe yeah. your father. Right? No, you don't. I do. I try, He's got man. a great record collection. No, he resists. Head. He resists. Let's, let's move on. Well, you know, there's that thing that they did to the Malcolm McDowell character in mm-hmm. Clockwork Orange where they propped his Prop eyes his open, eyelids and up tied him back and shoved the, the garden hose <laughs> Exactly. And then, and then he had to watch all those, those movies. Yeah. 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 Have you been to a wedding? Yes. You're familiar with five songs on this list already. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Just having been to a wedding. I mean, for example, people, you know, if you say to somebody, oh, well, you must know the, uh, the march from Lohengrin, from Wagner's <laughs> Lohengrin, and people go, you know, you know. Dum, dum, da, dum, da, yum, da, dum. Done. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Or you say the incidental music from uh, Mendelssohn's A Midsummer Night's Dream. But, ya, dum, da, 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 dum, dum, da, ya, pa, pum, pa, pa, pum. Another wedding march. Another wedding march. So these things are everywhere in the, and, oh my God, poor Paco Bell's canon. My students at the conservatory used to call it Taco Bell's canon. Yeah. Because <laughs> they, they had to play it all the time. Okay. Every let's time they let's had challenge a game. ourselves. All right. Because I know I was a wedding DJ for many oh, years. Okay. And so I know I've, po- I've played Pocket Bell's Cannon a hundred times. But when you say the word Pocket Bell's Cannon, I go, oh, yeah, that was track five on my, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I remember DJ it as that. CD. Yeah. But I don't remember the melody. 
And you know why? May I name that tune in three notes? Well, if it was me, I would have it in a second. Because, sure. Because all you're hearing is that ground bass. Da di da di done. Paco Bell's uh, Kennedy. Yeah. Da, right. Da 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 uh, and then yeah da 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 da. It all gets layered on top of that bass line. Yeah. So all it is is a bass line mm. with a new layer every time. So is that bass line Which the hook is, then? That's let's like the face motif? it, it is the it definition is of hip hop music. For me. Right. That's all I need to yeah. hear yeah. is three, those three descending notes of a major scale and done. I got it. Yeah. I'm there. Okay. I can tell you are. You yeah. were right there. You were right there with me. I saw it. I saw it in your eyes. <laughs> I felt it. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, if you. Let's keep moving down the list. If you saw the movie 2001, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how can you not, dum, you know. Dum. Well, right. That's Richard Strauss is also Sprock Zarathustra. But also, if you saw 2001, the Blue Danube Waltz, oh, all yeah, these sure. wonderful waltzes oh, yeah. that were that were in there. You see, I didn't even have to do the da 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 da. Yeah. These these dudes were with me. I know you would have. And been that's with super me. cartoon oh, yeah, right there. Like that song was in all the cartoons. Right. Mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny was doing no. something. Oh, that yeah. was there was like, anything yeah. graceful. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, right, right on twi- on Twinkle Toes. If mm-hmm. he was up to mischief, you know, like he was like trying to like I'm doing this, like I'm walking around like a girl in a in a bunny, you know, a bunny in a girl suit. He's trying to be tricky. What song is that? That's uh, from Wagner's Die Valkyrie. Oh, okay. The Val- Ride of the Valkyries. The Ride of the Valkyries. Yeah. Of course, you know, again, if we want to talk about movie, it's Apocalypse, Apocalypse now. Right. now. Right. I love the smell of Napalm yeah. in the morning. Napalm <laughs> smells like <laughs> victory. So, yeah. So, uh, you're doing better. You're doing better. Hold yeah. on. Let's... I get the hang of it. Okay. So, somebody in their 20s doesn't realize how much, how much Wagner they know. It's just iconic in mm-hmm. our culture because, because the music is so... Evocative. Mm-hmm. It's been used for a million and one things in other media. All right, so this is what I want to ask you then. So we Wait, we, let me challenge you, Pete. Yeah, okay. If you were to say, because your knowledge of, of literate music, mm. certainly not near Dr. Bob's, but yeah, it's but influenced Pete's by knowledge Dr. Bob. Of, Pete's knowledge of, of rock is like... And so, it's decent. And, and so your, your knowledge of rock. Uh-huh. If you were to assign a music producer to be the equivalent of Wagner, who do you think it'd be? A music producer to be so someone who does, when it comes to flavor, when yeah. it comes to I, when I think of prolifery, when I think of Wagner, I think of big and long, mm-hmm. like he's just like nothing about him is is small and tight and concise. Right. That's to me. Yeah. So who is big like that? Broad strokes. You know who it is? That's big Rick base. Rubin. He That's doesn't Rubin. care about the rules. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm going to take Johnny Cash and make you sing this song by. Do you Soundgarden. think Wagner spent years of his life not wearing shoes? Probably. Yeah. No. Oh. No, they didn't no. do that back then. Oh, no, he's no, no, he spent years of his life doing all kinds of nasty stuff. But but <laughs> if he wore shoes and he, he wore the most expensive shoes he could buy, probably with with uh, with with socks woven out of the pubic hair of virgins, because he had to have the best of everything. Oh, so who does that make him now? I don't know. I was thinking about Quincy Jones halfway through that, but not that pubic hair. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No. and that's probably not a good thing to say. But, but you know, right. it, just, it just what came to mind given the circumstances. No, but Quincy Jones is certainly surely painted a picture. Capable. Yeah, and I mean, really, and he can go big. It, they're and, peers, and he's actually not unfamiliar with finery. Yeah, so maybe Quincy. Yeah. Here's one for you. Ready? Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 I gave you two notes. I gave yeah. you two notes. Yeah. It's, it's gone. I, and I, it was kind I, of a giveaway because you said halla. But if you had just gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've taken four notes, maybe. Okay. You know, maybe maybe notes. okay. I, you know I, next time I won't give you the hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, to howl with you two. <laughs> so when we do album fights, one of the things we've learned is that some songs no longer belong to the artist. You know, like a song mm-hmm. like Yesterday. Mm-hmm. That doesn't belong to the Beatles. does not belong to Paul McCartney. That belongs to everybody. It belongs to the universe now. Right. And there are a lot of songs like that. Not a zillion. I thought people. it belonged to Michael Jackson, but okay, that just could be a copyright. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. I think actually he got, he sold it. Did he? But yeah. Either way, though, there are songs that are so ubiquitous, like The Wedding March. That's not Wagner's. Anymore. Or Hallelujah. Right. Yeah. Right. There are songs that are like that, that just... It doesn't matter who wrote them anymore. They are they are this thing. What are some songs that come to mind for that? Besides the wedding march, besides that, how many pieces of music? Yeah. The, the, well, you know, and it all depends. 
on the culture you're in, because we have our culture. But for example, I'm looking at my list here, and I'm seeing at the top of the second page a piece that you guys don't know. I bet you do not know Robert Schumann's Traumerei from the Kinderzine, and it's a piano piece. <laughs> you wouldn't know that. Mm-hmm. But if, you're, if you live in, lived in the Soviet Union or Russia today, that is the that that is more familiar to you than the national anthem hmm. and that's because of one of these strange miracles that occurred the end of the war uh the second world war was marked as may 8th of 1945 and some unknown apparatchik at moscow radio was tasked to find a piece of music that they could play at the moment that the hostilities were declared over that would somehow represent the Soviet uh, sacrifice. Mm. And you have to remember, when we talk about the Soviet sacrifice, no we kidding. are talking Substantial. about freaking sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about well over 20 million humans. 25, yes. million, uh, 25 million Russians, mm. right? There's a lot. I yeah. sure. it's, it's, it's well over 20 million. Okay. So this poor By contrast guy, for our listeners, the American casualties in World War II were how many? About 400,000? Yeah, something 400, like that. Yeah, not, not Versus years. well Where over 20 million. Well over 20 million. So anyway, this poor guy in a Stalinist country is asked to come up with a piece of music that somehow should represent in Moscow and all across his nation. I mean, I, if I were him, I just would have put my head, you know, in the toilet and flushed at that point. <laughs> but the piece he chose was genius. He chose this traumerei, which means dream piece. Traum is dream in German. And it's very slow, it's very sad, it's very meditative, and it's by a German composer, Robert Schumann. And this is what they played at whatever it was, noon on May 8th, uh, on the national radio in Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, to mark the end of the war. Genius. Hmm. The sadness and the melancholy represented perfectly the sense of loss that everyone felt. Yes, this was a great victory, but look at what cost it's been. Wow. And that trauma has become a, the second national anthem. It is played 24 hours a day at all, at all the military. Talk about hashtag never forget. At all of the military <laughs> wow. uh, graveyards in yeah. the Soviet Union. It was played, it is played at the, at the death of every Soviet and Russian leader since then while mm. they lay in state. This is the music that they played when Stalin lay in state in 53. You know, when, when Khrushchev laid in state, it, and it's so beautiful because it's yeah. by a German composer. Yeah. Wow. So it's just, so again, in the United States, we wouldn't know this from Adam. Most people mm. wouldn't. Yeah. But if you live in Russia, and I'll tell you one more story and then I'll stop because it's something everyone, everyone should look up on YouTube. There was a wonderful. That's the Break It Down show. Well, aside from the Break It oh, Down Oh, okay. Show, yeah. There was a superb pianist named Vladimir Horowitz one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century. Hmm. And he was born in Russia at the end of the 19th century. And like so many people, after the revolution, 1917 to 1921, he couldn't go back. He couldn't go back. They threw his family piano out the window. The communists took over his home. He lost everything. So he settled in the West and became an American citizen. He finally went back to Russia in the mid-1980s. Now, he's in his mid-80s, very old, but still a superb pianist. He goes back to Russia for the first time. They ship his own piano with him. It, there's, all, there's all kinds of wonderful documentaries about it. But here's what I want everyone to know. You look up Horowitz Traumerei or Horowitz Moscow. Here he's giving a concert in the Grand Hall of the Conservatory in Moscow. Plays a concert, everyone goes crazy. Then one encore. Yeah. Quietly, elegantly, he plays the Traumerei.
out of dry eye in the house. The place sure. goes crazy. People, I mean, just, everyone is just sitting there with the tears rolling down their faces. And of wow. course, it's just so, and then he finishes it, and he just shrugs. A little shrug. Shrugs. And it's just so moving. Yeah. yeah. So freaking moving for what that piece represented those people and what it meant to him to come back and play in Moscow 60 years after he had left. Well, 65 you, years. You know what's about, amazing about that is nowadays we're infatuated with the mic drop. And that was his <laughs> ability to take the mic off of the stand, gently lay it down and walk away. Yeah, yeah. You know, amazing things can be done quietly. Yeah. But what made this work, of course, is, is what that what that piece represents to the Russian people. Yep. And so, like I say, there are certain things I put on this list that are going to have more importance to other people. Here's another one. Well, before we go further, I just want to remind our listeners. Thank you for stopping me. It's robertgreenbergmusic.com. <laughs> yeah. Robertgreenbergmusic.com. I swear, everybody, I subscribe. Please. Well, you know what you should subscribe to is my Patreon page. Everything. That's true. Because, yes. because now I'm writing two additional articles a week oh, nice. for Patreon and also running Music History Monday on Patreon. And for the big cost of two bucks a month, oh, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you three or four of my days, my days a week. It's two bucks a yeah. month to become a patron. On Robert Greenberg's <laughs> Patreon page. And then you go directly to heaven. You do not have to stop and listen to French <laughs> music. Listen, yeah. you spend two bucks a month, dear listener, on mm -hmm. anal beads. I swear to you. Don't, don't they because cost more than that? Because that one set that you bought, uh -huh. you've amortized over the last yeah, right. probably year and a half, right? Year and a half they go, Pete? And if they're, you, cheap, if they're cheap, they're glass. They're last longer you don't want to do that. You just gotta be no, you don't get the cheap You, wind you, don't want you go big. The point is, robertgreenbergmusic.com. Subscribe to everything. Go to patreon.com. Look for Robert Greenberg. Subscribe to everything there, too. For the bargain basement price of $2 a month. Also, you can buy uh, gift cards Yeah. for this Christmas season. And there is no better gift than literacy, vocabulary, enlightenment, and all of those things can be had at robertgreenbergmusic.com. And the occasional yeah. rather off-color reference. Yeah, absolutely. If I might true. say. Yeah. The ability to go and listen to a symphony. We had Nick Ravellis from San Diego Opera, and he talked about all of the great things on the West Coast, from Seattle all the way down to San Diego, and all of the incredible music, if you're on this part of the world, that you and can And all the way down to Arizona. To. Yeah, I mean, Arizona has a great symphony, right? And you do a lot of stuff with them. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, that's, that's not stroking. That's, it's honest. So seriously, like, you guys owe it to yourselves. Take your, your loved one, and if you're not sure what to go listen to, our Greenberg Music on Twitter and ask and say, here's what's coming up. What should I do? Oh, go see The Marriage of Figaro. It's like watching an episode of Cheers. When you talked about Schumann's... Trauma Rye. Trauma Rye. You, when you described it, you also described Candle in the Wind from Elton John. Really? He right, played it right, for Lady Di, right, and he's like, I right. don't play that song anymore. He, like, he gave that away, and right. he can't play it because it makes right. him too emotional. You know, it's another song that's perfect for the time. Right. And you hope as a musician, well, I hear I'm telling you, you hope as a composer to have these, and we find these songs all the time in the album fights where you're like, just once in your life, something this Perfect. Give me, give me one of these significant things in my life. That's right, it. exactly. Yeah. Great anecdote. I was just reading the other day. Brahms had a very good friend. Brahms, a wonderful German composer. He had a friend named Theodore Henschel, who ended up as a conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So a high end, high end musician. So anyway, this guy uh, Henschel, uh, Brahms were taking a vacation together in Italy, and uh, Henschel starts w whistling a tune from one of Brahms' uh, string quartets because apparently he was like this expert whistler. Well, Brahms was so happy. And usually he was a total prick. Mm -hmm. But he said, you actually remember a melody I wrote? Yeah. He said, my dear friend, that's all any of us could want. He says, can you imagine how, how, how the ghosts of Beethoven and Mozart must feel, mm -hmm. knowing that their music means so much to so many people and the rest of us worms who are, you know, like underground. Yeah. He said, anyone would remember. But here's one thing that I think might be lost on many of us and, and many among our listeners is that when you mention Brahms, it's one of the names of old. Right. But he was alive when the United States was alive. He was alive when the United States had its 100th anniversary. Yeah. See, to me, these people are alive. Yeah. I have to say, I know so much about them. Right. I love their music so much that, to me, it's like a, it's like a friend. Mm. It's just like a friend. Yeah. 
Well, to our listeners that are going, you know, this is interesting and stuff, but I'm not going to go to robertbeanrevmusic.com and, and subscribe to stuff. You're a fool. Yeah. This is where the difference lies because I am, if I may be so bold as to claim credit, I'm a, I'm a bit of a contemporary music historian. Sure. Hearing you talk today, uh, when I edited the show and put it up with Prince versus Van Morrison, yeah. you're talking about that stuff. You're Greenbergian in your knowledge of wow. Prince. We're both complimented. Wow. Yeah. We're both complimented. Seriously, he knows so much about it. But in the times that you and I spent together, Pete, doing a variety of things that forced us to be crammed together, <laughs> the great equalizer was your reference points for music throughout history. Because I can quote the last 30, 40, maybe 50 years pretty well. But to be able to go back two, 300 years and give that context, that's powerful. That's knowledgeable and that gives you an enlightenment that's really that's important and that's somewhat unusual. You guys have heard me play my stupid year game, haven't you? Yes. My perspective I like your game. year game. Uh-huh. I like it. You've I heard use it. it all the time. Wow. Yeah. My dad was 92 when he passed last year. So I say three human lifetimes, my dad's lifetime. It's a long lifetime, but it's a human lifetime. Three lifetimes. Becoming more and more commonly a human lifetime. Yeah, so uh, uh, in this case, uh, 276 years. So 276 years ago, it was what? It was- That's uh, three of those. Three Three lifetimes back to back, okay? Born, die, born, die, born, die. That's it, three lifetimes. It was 1742. 1742. 1742. Joseph Haydn and George Washington were both 10 years old. Wow. And just, Washington is presumably chopping down cherry trees. Yeah. Uh, in 1742, Johann Sebastian Bach is, uh, is 15. He's 57 years old. He's sitting in Leipzig writing the Goldberg Variations. Uh, in 1742, Mozart is not going to be born for another 14 years. In not seven, yet born for another 14 years. In 1742... Beethoven is not going to be born for another 28 years. Wow. And Beethoven's mom, Anna, Anna Maria Magdalena uh, Keverich, hasn't been born yet. Wow. Three lifetimes ago, Beethoven's mom has not been born yet. So it just... It's not that far. All of our repertoire... Yeah. And your game isn't crazy because as we, you and I have exchanged just an email, President John Tyler, who took over when William Henry Harrison died... He's got grandkids that are still alive. Grand. Grandkids. Just grandchildren. Right. Not great. Regular old grandkids. Right. And it just goes to show we're just so arrogant about the rate yeah. of change, but we forget that the last 270, 280 years is not just in geologic history, in human history, very recent. Yeah. And that's the repertoire. There you go. The, the, the oldest pieces in the regular repertoire, like the Toccata, go back mm-hmm. to about 1710. Yeah. And that's the earliest, basically, in the repertoire. So it's, you know, it's 300 years. Worth Does the of window close as time goes further ahead? I don't ahead? think so. You don't think so? I don't okay. think so. And there's a lot of reasons why. But a lot of it has to do with the standardization I talked about before. Yeah. Standardization of notation, standardization of tuning systems, standardization of, of, of the expressive content of our music. I think Bach will always be, Bach and Vivaldi will always be the bedrocks of the Western repertoire as we know them. And I think we'll just increase repertoire now rather than kind of move forward. Does our movement away from a God-fearing society, at least in the Western world, does that kind of start to close the door on those things? Because a lot of that music is, is church music. It I mean, is. He's a, a Kappelmeister. Of, but having said that, you know... That's you know, a deep reference right there, Pete. Well, oh, but, okay. but even, when Bach, even when Bach wrote his secular music, he dedicated it all to God. Right. For Bach, there was no difference between religious and secular. That was his life. He gave God credit for his creation, and everything he should do should be for the love of God. So no, I, I, I don't think that's a problem. And I, when I look at the great religious music, it's pan-religious. It, mm. I mean, we, we look at Bach's St. Matthew Passion, we look at Beethoven's Mrs. Solemnus or Verdi's Requiem. I mean, it makes no difference that one was a Lutheran and two were Catholic. It's universal. Yeah. It's, 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 about, it's about the human spirit. It's about believing in something. It's about, it's about the golden rule. I, I have no problems with that. So no, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, overtly, overtly religious music still represents some of the greatest art of all time. Do we not look at the Sistine Chapel? Do we not look great at, the, art. at the Pietas by Michelangelo? Right. Right. I mean, excuse me, these so transcend their origins uh, as religious art. You know, Da Vinci's The Last Supper. I mean, excuse me. It's, this is, you stand there and you weep. Well, and what musician 
comes in saying, I have no influences. They all have influences. Oh, you might that, hear a piece of anything, and it could absolutely be divine music or whatever you want to call anyone it. Anyone who says that is an idiot. I no, remember, one, no, one, no one credible says that. Well, I do remember reading an article about Eric Dolphy, who, who's playing, I don't know if you know who's playing, he's a free jazz guy from the 60s and 70s, a horn player, saxophone player. I, I hated the way he sounded. He just sounded like an idiot. But when I read this interview in Downbeat, because this is when I read Downbeat, I mean, it made all the sense in the world. He said, man, I don't want to sound like anyone. I'm making my own music, my own music. I'm not going to sound like anyone. I'm thinking, you know, that's, okay, welcome to the Tower of Babel. Yeah. You don't want to sound like anyone? Then no one's going to be able to talk to you. Yeah. Because you're going to have your own language, and it's going to be your own language. It's going to sound like someone farting. Which is, by the way, how it sounded. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I better throw my greatest hits of his away then, yeah, I mean, if, if I, I wonder how someone could be an Eric Dolphy fan, and I'm sure it's possible if you're stoned at high enough or you're, you know, committing, considering suicide, I'm sure it's all possible. Eric Dolphy, the whoopee cushion suite. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good transition. Okay. You go. So, okay, we, we had Chris Thomas King on the show. He's won two different blues Grammys. Wow. Yeah, and he was born in a juke joint. His, you know, his dad's place was called Tabby's Blue Box. Oh, We're box. not sure that he was born in the juke joint. He may have been laid on a fence post. For sure. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's as blues as they get. Yeah. So the Grammys saw fit to not include him in the contemporary blues category, even though he submitted. And didn't really give him a reason why, so we had him on the show to talk about it. And you listen to his album, and you hear, and, and this, I mean this to be a compliment to him, you hear, like, how B.B. King might play the guitar. You, you hear Eric Clapton and how he, like, their peers are all bluesmen. You know, you hear 12 bar blues, you hear all of these things and it's contemporary. So you get to push the bounds, you know, that this is what he does. How, how do they justify kicking someone out? Who's an artist in that genre? Like just don't vote for him. You know, if you don't like him for some reason, what do you, how do you, you know, how do you reckon with that? What was his explanation? A bunch of, cultural appropriation bigots who will give it a reward to Mick Jagger and not a guy who was born and raised in South Louisiana. And One argument is this, that they didn't kick him out of the category as much as this particular release of his did not qualify specifically as contemporary blues because it was too experimental. And that is one person's interpretation we have not heard from Naris. Have you asked them? Pete, Pete engaged them. Yeah, I haven't heard anything back. And they, and they didn't respond. But I think it's safe to imagine that it's something along those lines. And we shouldn't probably assume that he, as an artist, was kicked out of the category, but just that this particular piece of work, which is plenty bluesy, was somehow more experimental than they were comfortable with leaving in the category. And I think Chris's beef is that last year's contemporary blues category Grammy was won by Mick Jagger. And to him, here's a guy who came from England with the mission, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was stated by the Rolling Stones, that they would take American blues music and sell it back to the Americans. So, you know, it, in terms of Chris's sentiment about it, how dare the Grammys dislodge me from the category that I was born to be in. Do you have a feeling for what you think composers from eras gone by might think about what we're doing with their music in terms of how we categorize it or how we... What do you think? I, I, I'm going to address the Grammys specifically, okay. and I'm going to address the folly of these awards that are given. Grammys, Emmys, Academy Awards, Tonys, this prize, that prize... Should Bob Dylan have won a Nobel Prize in literature? Please. You know, the people who judge these things, again, there's always, and I'm going to sound more cynical than I mean to now, but it's all a pile of bullshit. It's all politics. The Grammys are there to sell records. That's why the Grammys exist, to sell records. They're, they're part of an industry, and it's the way of getting the industry out there. The Academy Awards, oh my God, it's about getting people to go to movies. These are the nominated movies. Now you have six more weeks to see all of them. It's a self-congratulatory marketing device created by 
marketeers and the large industry to sell more stuff, period. And the moment you forget that and think it's about artistry, then you're dead. Mm. My favorite response to a prize of all time was the great Charles Ives, a magnificent American composer who made his career as an insurance man, uh, founded what turned out to be Mutual of New York. And so he kept his music pure. He never tried to make money off of it. And when it was published, he gave the proceeds to charity, supported a tremendous number of composers anonymously because he made a lot of money in the insurance business. Well, his music was recognized 30, 40, 50 years after it was composed. He was quite elderly when his third symphony was finally premiered and received a a Pulitzer Prize in like 1946, 1947, Mm. 35 years after it was composed. And he's already, I guess, uh, approaching his 80th, if not in his 80th year. And um, he gave the money away. He he, he told the committee, uh, send it here and send it here. He gave most of the money to Lou Harrison, who uh, was a composer who lived out here in uh, in California, because Lou Harrison conducted the premiere of this Third Symphony. And his comment was, you know what? Prizes are for little boys, and I'm a grown man. And that's the right freaking attitude because most of us never get a damned prize. Yeah. And the politics are crazy. For example, the Pulitzers. It's all about New York. I'm sorry, as a Californian, and the fact that I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and grew up in suburban New York and New Jersey means nothing. I live in California, therefore I'm a Californian. Well, it's almost impossible for Californians to get recognized. It's not, th- not that it doesn't happen. But Pulitzers and Guggenheims and all these big, the Graumeyer Prize, all these big music prizes, I'm sorry, very rarely do any of us out here see those things. It's politics, politics, and more politics. And we just have to accept, you just have to accept that. Of course we all wish we got these prizes. My God, a Graumeyer, you know what that means? It's like $400,000 prize. Mm. I mean, it means taking the financial pressure off your life for years. Yeah. So it's not that, that I wouldn't like to have the money, for example. Oh, give me the money, absolutely. And the honor would be nice. But there's just, you just can't get wrapped up in it. So back to your question, back to this issue. This guy is pissed off and rightly pissed off because he feels a cultural usurpation. And there's no doubt about it. But it's not about him. He's not going to sell enough albums. Yeah. You know, you give a prize to Mick Jagger. Okay, so another 50,000 albums get bought. He's got an experimental blues album that is clearly contemporary blues from what you described. Yeah. No one's going to buy it. Why give it a prize? Yeah. Excuse me, I don't mean to sound cynical, but that's what these organizations are in business for. They're going to give prizes to something that's not going to sell? Never. Ever. So he should take it as a badge of reward, as a badge of courage, of artistic courage, that they weren't interested in it. He knows how good he is, right? Yep. He's already won two Grammys. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. he, he, he's beholden to nobody. To no one nobody. has to tell him he's good or bad. Yeah. He knows who he is. Yeah. It's a badge of honor that what he did was too forward for these idiots. And it's true that that motherfucker's bad. <laughs> he's bad. It's well, it's a, bad. it's a badge of honor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That he's doing something that's so new and different that these idiots don't know how to categorize it. Sometimes when I want to just crap around. I love wine speak. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're trying to come up with words that describe things that don't want to be described with words. So, you know, it's got a hint of old tobacco and shoe leather. Well, you know what? If it really did, you wouldn't want to drink it. Right. But we're just trying to find words to There's approximate. Ash. There's ash. Well, it's Lemons. This, yeah, it's the same thing with these Grammy categories. They've become so freaking ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to try to say, you know, a, a, you know, a experimental ska with, uh, with Mozartian influence category. Mm-hmm. Well, that's going to be a big number of bands, won't it? Well, and how many times has the Grammys or any other organization like, oh, shit, we have absolutely done you wrong, person with 40 plus years in the industry. Let's just go ahead and give you the oh, shit award because... You should have 10 of these Grammys. Who's tr- and who's making these judgments? Yeah. That's the other thing about critics versus the artist. Yeah. The oh shit award. <laughs> well, who's, who's making these judgments? Yeah. Absolutely. Who's deciding what should be better? I've sat on, I, I can't tell you how many juries I've sat on. A jury meaning a, 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 a prize committee deciding 
who, you know, for example, for, for like 30 years, I sat on a prize committee every January. And I'm going to sit on it one more time this January. And we have to give a composition prize. It's so arbitrary. Hmm. You got six people on the committee. It's not the best piece. It's the piece six people can agree on. Yeah. Well, that's a whole different ball game, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. it's a whole different ball game. It's arbitrary. It's disgusting. It's awful. And yet, now we've awarded one piece, someone a, a prize. Presumably, it means that that piece is better than the others, and it's not. The top five, the top six, everything is equal. It's just totally ugly and arbitrary. And for years and years, one of these committees I did gave two first place prizes. Mm. Not a first and a second, just two prizes. That at least obviated the need to decide which one was better. Right. Nothing's better. Right. Oh, at, at the highest end, everything is deserving. I can't stand watching the Olympics anymore. I'm a pussy. And I'm not talking about team sports. I'm talking about skating and acrobatics, you know, the singular performances. Yeah. It is so freaking amazing that what these athletes, what they've overcome, what they've dealt with, what they do is so beautiful. To be judging them on these minute scales of tenth of a point, yeah. I realize there has to be criteria. As far as I'm concerned, they should all get freaking gold medals. And it's not participation medals. They've already accomplished everything by being there, yeah. by showing up. I totally agree. Like, this, like the skiing, when you're deciding things by a thousandth of a second, there is no difference. Yeah. There's no, you can't see what it is. And even if you no. can, like, your bodies are there at the same time. Yep. You know, yeah. uh, Michael, a guy pushed the button a little bit different. Yeah, Michael Phelps at one point became the greatest Olympian ever, and he won by half a fingernail. Half a fingernail. That's not a difference. That's the same. You guys at the same time. So God bless him. You know, yeah. that's the criteria. Right. I admit that's those are the rules of the game everyone has agreed to play. Right. But judging art and figure skating is is art, for example. For example. Judging art is notoriously impossible and no matter what your criteria are you can't take everything into account yeah these grammys are a perfect example the prejudices of the judges are 90 percent of the ball game and that's always the case yeah well the grammy is i think it's divided by judges and then it's voted on by the academy members but by the time the Academy members get their hands on it, it's already been divided. You know, the field has been divided. And how many Academy sense. members know about experimental blues? Yeah. In all honesty, let's, let's, let's really be honest now. Yeah. I mean, when we fill out our ballots, when we just filled out our long California ballots, do we really know who's running for school board? Do we really know the, the difference between the various people running for judge or tax right. assessor? Yeah. assessor? You know, even us, when we're, we're having to judge stuff, we don't know anything about so we vote party or we don't vote at all. Yep. You know, by what criteria when you don't know anything? Yeah. Right. All you needed to do is get one, one card slipped under your front door. That name seems vaguely familiar. Okay, I'll vote for that person. Yeah. It can't be any different with the Grammys, with these categories. It right. can't possibly be any different. Okay, so here's what I want to do because I want to give Dr. Bob his evening back. <laughs> and I don't want to end specifically on that note. I'd like to end on a note where you challenge our listeners to do something to expand their music vocabulary. Uh, what I'm going to challenge you all to do, and this is the easy one, is go to robertgreenbergmusic.com, subscribe to stuff, go to Patreon, and search for Robert Greenberg. He's easy to find. And, and become a patron. For the, of course, you can be as generous as you'd like, but for the low, low price of $2 a month, you get a couple extra articles every week. You expand your musical vocabulary by miles very quickly. So those things also... Try out the great courses that you can buy on robertgreenbergmusic.com, including uh, the introductory to it all, which is how to listen to and understand great music. And buy somebody the gift of music literacy by purchasing a gift card at robertgreenbergmusic.com. And I thank you for that awesome plug. I'm, I'm talking to John's son, Nico. Nico, I'm keeping him. Yeah. Okay. Love it. You can visit. You have okay. visitation rights. Okay. All right. But we're, we're keeping Gat. Okay? All right. And Sounds I will good say to me. this because, uh, <laughs> because you've been on our show many, many times, but every time that you come on our show, we learn something new, 
We yeah. have some kind of revelation. We have a debate on the way home that has uh, always been stimulating. And we just, you know, we appreciate your presence in our lives and in our education about not just music, but about the way that things move our souls. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like our listeners to do to, to challenge themselves and to expand their own musical vocabulary? Yes. And it's something that it works on both sides because people who are involved in the oral tradition of music, you know, let's say you got a someone who's, who's a hip-hop fiend and... Um, that person might feel that this literate music we've been talking about today has no meaning to them, and it's just a, 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 it, just, it just has no meaning. It has no presence in their life, no relevance. Whereas someone involved in the concert world might think that hip-hop is just, you know, it's just gutter music, and it has no relevance. Well, I would speak to all those people. You're all wrong, each and every one of you. The joy of music, the joy of anything human beings do well is that it's all illuminating. So the, the task I always ask is to throw out the terms, throw out these classifications, back to the Grammy, yeah. throw out these classifications that don't do us any good except to separate us from stuff that's just music because we feel that it's above us or beyond us or below us or irrelevant to us. Mm -hmm. It's all relevant. It's all life enhancing. It's all beautiful. And to fool around on YouTube and just here we've been talking about some pieces yeah. um, and maybe maybe you could uh, put some of these pieces up online you know that, that we've named here today just very well known uh, literate pieces and folks just just go to YouTube and listen to the first five minutes and enjoy it just enjoy it just because it's music by a, by a fellow human being it doesn't matter when it was written it's relevant it doesn't matter who wrote it it's relevant it's just you know it's just music so my assignment always, don't worry about when, don't worry about the classification. Just see if it speaks to you. And if it does, enjoy it. Boom. Well.